Suppose you have a large collection of 2x1 dominoes and you want to fill up the 2xn grid so that no dominoes overlap and no squares left uncovered. For instance, when n equals 1, there is just one such arrangement and we call this a tiling of the 2xn board. When n equals 2, there are two such tilings because we can put both dominoes vertically or both dominoes horizontally, like this. Things get a bit more interesting if we consider the 2x5 board. Now, we can list out all the tilings like this. Once we're finished, we see that there are a total of 8 tilings. And things get even more interesting when we consider the 2x10 board. Here, let's list off all of the tilings. Did you guess that there would be 89 total tilings of the 2x10 board? The general question that we're interested in is how many ways can you do this for the 2xn board in general? For instance, here is one tiling when n is 20. Can we figure out the total number of tilings for the 2x20 board? What about if n is bigger? The idea we'll pursue is to list off the different counts for various n values and search for patterns. In order to do this formally, we'll have to define what we mean by a sequence. A sequence is an ordered list of numbers. We write this using a parentheses, and then we list off the numbers a0, a1, a2, a3, and so on. We can list this in shorthand notation by writing a parentheses a sub n and saying where n starts and where it finishes, or we use infinity if it never ends. Let's see a few examples of some lists that are sequences. Do any of these sequences look familiar to you? Here's a question. Can you describe the sequences formally? Can you guess the next entry in any of them? How can we go about doing this? One of the gold standards for describing sequences is using a closed formula. Given a sequence, we call a sub k the kth term, and we call the number k the index of this term. A closed formula for the sequence a sub n, then, is a formula for a n using only finitely many operations that depend on n and not on the other terms of the sequence. Let's see an example. Suppose the sequence a sub n is given by the numbers 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, and so on. In this case, the number 25 is the fifth term, so a sub 5 equals 25. One way to make sense of this sequence is to recognize that it's counting the number of dots in these arrays. So the first one is in a one by one array. The number four is in a two by two array. The number nine is the number of dots in a three by three array. The number 16 is the number of dots in a four by four array. The number 25 is the number of dots in a five by five array. And the number 36 is the number of dots in a six by six array. This pattern continues. From this, we see that a1 equals 1 times 1, or 1 squared. a2 equals 2 times 2, which is 2 squared. a3 equals 3 times 3, which is 3 squared. a4 equals 4 times 4, which is 4 squared. a5 equals 5 times 5, which is 5 squared. a6 equals 6 times 6, which is 6 squared. From this, we believe the pattern, and we would guess that a closed form is a sub n equals n squared. Therefore, we have found that this is the sequence of squares. Sometimes we can't find a closed formula, but we may be able to find other ways of describing the sequence, such as a recursive formula. A recursive formula for a sequence consists of two things. First, a recurrence relation, which is a formula for a term using previous terms in the sequence. And second, we need a list of initial conditions, which is a list of the first few terms of the sequence, enough to use in the recurrence. 
Let's see an example. Suppose our sequence is the collection of numbers 1, 1, 2, 6, 24, 120, 7, 20. Let's try to find a recursive formula. The first thing we can notice is that a0 is 1, and a1 is 1, which happens to be 1 times a0. a2 is 2, which happens to be 2 times a1. Next we see a3 is 6, which is 3 times a2. After that we see a4 is 24, which happens to be 4 times a3. And a5 is 120, which is 5 times a4. Finally we see a6, which is 720, is 6 times a5. From this, we believe the pattern continues so that a n is equal to n times a sub n minus 1 for n is greater than or equal to 1, and the initial condition is that a0 equals 1. Together with these two rules, we can build the entire sequence. We will note that we've already seen this sequence before. This is the factorial sequence, and we use the formula a sub n equals n exclamation point to represent this sequence. Let's see another example. Suppose that we have the sequence t sub n, which is given by the numbers 0, 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28. Let's find a recursive formula for t sub n. In this case, it helps to notice that these numbers are counting the number of dots in these triangular arrays. Then we note that the first triangular array sits inside the second triangular array, so t2 equals t1 plus the two dots on the bottom. Notice that the second triangular array sits inside the third triangular array at the top. So in this case, we see t3 equals t2 plus the three dots on the bottom. We can continue this pattern, noting that we can embed each triangular array in the next. So t4 equals t3 plus the four dots at the bottom. And then t5 equals t4 plus the five dots at the bottom. And then t6 equals t5 plus the six dots at the bottom. If we believe this pattern continues, we then see that t sub n equals t sub n minus one plus n for n is greater than or equal to one, as long as we have the initial condition t zero equals zero. Let's investigate this sequence a little bit more. From the recursive definition, we see that t sub one is equal to one, t sub two is t one plus two, but we can replace that by one plus two. t sub three is equal to t two plus three, but we can replace that by one plus two plus three. Then t four is t three plus four, but we can replace that by one plus two plus three plus four. We can continue this pattern so that t5 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, and t6 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. We see that in general, t sub n can be written as the running sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n. This is a formula where we just have to add all of the first n positive integers to get t sub n. But this suggests a general definition. Given a sequence or a list of numbers, we can build a new sequence called the sequence of partial sums in the following way. We keep a running sum so that bn is the sum of the terms from a0 all the way up to an. This notation is a little tedious, so we need to introduce some new notation for this. To deal with sequences of partial sums, we'll introduce what is known as summation notation. We use the symbol sigma to represent summation notation. So this symbol indicates that what we want to do is that the sigma means add up a bunch of terms, and the i equals 1 to n means we do this in stages. When i is 1, we add a1. When i is 2, we add a2. When i is 3, we add a sub 3. And we keep going so that the second to last term is when i equals n minus 1, where we add a sub n minus 1, and the final term when i equals n is when we add a sub n. This is known as summation notation, and we read it as the sum of a sub i, where i ranges from 1 to n. Let's try out a few examples to see this in action. The first sum is the sum from i equals 1 to n of i. We again realize that the sigma means you're going to add up a bunch of terms, and we go stage by stage. When i is 1, we add i equals 1. When i is 2, we substitute 2, and we see we add 2. When i is 3, we substitute i equals 3, and we see that we're adding 3. 
when i is n minus 1, we add n minus 1, and finally we stop when i equals n, and we add n. This is exactly the sequence we encountered when we found the number of dots in triangular arrays. For our second example, let's consider the sum of i squared where i ranges from 1 to n. Again, the sigma means we're going to add up a bunch of terms, and we're going to go stage by stage. When i is 1, we add 1 squared. When i is 2, we add 2 squared. When i is 3, we add 3 squared. When i is n minus 1, we add the quantity n minus 1 squared. And for the final sum and, i is equal to n, so we add n squared. This represents the sum of squares of the first n positive integers. Notice we can even do this with a constant sequence. So we can sum 1, where i goes from 1 to n, by just adding 1 over and over again. Notice that the 1 doesn't depend on the index. So when i is 1, we add 1. When i is 2, we add 1. When i is 3, we add 1. And we just keep adding 1 until we get to i equals n, so that we've added up n copies of 1. This is just a representation for the number n. We should note that all sequences of partial sums are recursive. You can find the sum of the first n plus 1 terms of a sequence by first finding the sum of the first n terms and then adding the n plus first term. So sequences of partial sums are not given in terms of closed formulas yet. So here's a question. Given a particular sequence, can we find a closed form, which is the gold standard, for the sequence? Here's an example for us to consider. What if we consider the sequence we saw before? b sub n, which is the sum of the first n positive squares. Can we find a closed formula for this sequence? We can list off the numbers as 0, 1, 5, 14, 30, we keep going, but can we guess a formula, closed formula, for b sub n? We know that b sub n is the sum, so we can write it as a sequence of partial sums of squares, and we could go back and try to represent this as a collection of dots, remembering that the squares give me the number of dots in a square array. What we want to do to find b sub n is we want to add up all of these arrays together. Perhaps we can stack them on top of one another like this, and use this representation to find a closed formula. Can you do that? Let's finish this video by following up on our domino tilings that we started with. Maybe now we can figure out how many there are, using the sequence approach. So let's let f sub n be the number of ways to fill up the 2 by n grid with 2 by 1 dominoes in such a way that no dominoes overlap and no square is uncovered. As we've already seen, f sub 1 equals 1. There's only one tiling. When n is 2, we saw that f sub 2 was equal to 2. Here are the two tilings. We can investigate more. When n is 3, we can list out all the tilings, and we see that there are a total of three such tilings. Let's keep going. Let's try when n equals 4, because something interesting happens. In this situation, there are not four tilings as you might have guessed. Instead, there are a total of five tilings, so f sub 4 equals 5. Using our counting techniques, we can actually find a formula for f sub n, the number of ways to tile the n board. In order to do this, we have to make the realization that all tilings of the n-board can be split into two disjoint cases, the ones where there's a vertical tile starting it off, or the one where there's two horizontal tiles starting it off. In the first case, since we've placed the vertical tile, we have total freedom in how we place the remaining tiles on an n-1 board, since we've already filled up one spot. Therefore, we see that in this case, there's going to be a total of f sub n-1 tilings. So fn is equal to fn minus 1 plus the other tilings. But for the other tilings, we see that we've already covered up two spots with the first two tiles. Therefore, we can tile the remaining n minus 2 board in the number of ways possible. Since these two tilings are disjoint because of how they start, we see that f sub n is equal to fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. And we add the initial conditions f1 equals 1 and f2 equals 2. Therefore, we can generate f sub n as large as we want using this recursive definition.